Right, right. Well, I got to this time 10 minutes, 40 seconds through the, um, mm, part A of this, uh, S1191F. And, uh, I realized that the world has mirrored in a material way by its um, pyramidal structure of politics and power. It sort of, in a material sense, worships the king, the emperor. He's the personification and epitome of the values that you think are holding the empire or the country or the state together. And of course, um, well, <laughs> this is very much the equivalent of worshipping man. And we, we, we dismiss the fact that this absurd, unreasonable privilege of um, maximal wealth and power is, is invested in their hands. And uh, as we've said in a secular way, all power corrupts and our kings and emperors have been fine examples of this. <laughs> And the Jesus story reacts to it and says, you know, as Jesus talked to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, my people would fight. But it's not. And the Jesus story changes this tyrannical thunder god, war god, emperor, view in the form of Yahweh, Yahweh, however you pronounce the name of the God of the Hebrew, who, you know, destroys all the world but eight people and euthanates, euthanizes Jericho and all of Canaan if necessary. roars in thunder from the mountains and terrifies the people so that <laughs> they send Moses up, they're not going to go up themselves. Transforms this God into Dad, Abba, Father. I mean, you couldn't have a bigger contrast. A loving relationship um, personified and viewed as utterly heavenly and glorious the personification of all that is truly good and personal, loving and kind and providing in the way that the perfect parent does. They just give because they love the children and we are the children, his children in the story. It's a very good story because it holds the image before us of what we find with experience in this world, sometimes very hard knocks, we find it is exactly what we truly value. I think that is the case. What do you think? You know, what I'm saying is that this is the great accomplishment of the Jesus story. And, um, well, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> By which I think it's meant practice 
eating it. Does it taste good? Does it do you good? <laughs> I don't think of puddings as doing me good. I tend to think of it being fruit that does me good. And again, I use the same analogy there, don't I? That, well, I can't explain convincingly to the person who's not convinced <laughs> that fruit is the best way to go, but try it for a little while. It's not likely to kill you in that limited time span. And if you find there are great benefits, well, you'll know the way to go. In a sense, you'll have proved it, not logically and rationally, perhaps, but perhaps, or you'll come up with the logical and rational explanation. But what's really driving it is it works. You find you're a happier, healthier, spiritual, more loving, kind person, then that's the way you'll continue going. Whether we're talking about a fruit diet or <laughs> loving God, thanking God, thanking God that seems not too irrational, does it, for all the good things. And then, with wisdom and experience, extending this to thanking God for, hmm, well, at least the minor mishaps. And starting to see how so often you can see that what appeared to be a bad thing turned out to be quite a blessing. <laughs> and that's the sum total of it. Practicing thankfulness brings you all the spiritual worth that you truly do value. And, uh, well, you find you have the kingdom of heaven, life eternal. This is life eternal to know thee from all the good that you have given us. Wonderful one. Love you. Thank you, Dad.